now it is. So in me, I was probably advancing one behind one. So um, you probably don't have patients laying awake at night worrying about getting chicken gunya from their blood transfusion. Um, but some of the things we don't screen for are probably a bigger issue uh, than those that we do, since we're so good at screening out the bad stuff and the stuff we screen. Um, <clears throat> talk about more of the focus on the non-infectious complications. And then in light of that, talk about evolving indications for um, transfusion, as well as some of the age of blood, as well as uh, fixed plasma, blood cell ratios, and massive transfusion. So again, the typical patient, when you're confronted by the need for a transfusion, might say, oh, AIDS, or if they're particularly sophisticated, hepatitis. Um, and if there's one thing I can convince you of, uh, is the things we screen for, HIV, hepatitis B, C, uh, you will never see in your life. There may or may not be one transfusion transmission case of one of those uh, every five to 10 years uh, out of 20 million blood products transfused annually. Uh, that said, uh, living in Minnesota, which is one of the endemic hotspots for Babesia, uh, we, Babesia is the most common transfusion transmitted uh, uh, organism uh, currently, uh, and we probably in Minnesota get one a year of uh, documented transfusion uh, transmission cases. Uh, malaria, even despite uh, rigorous deferrals for, for donor travel, almost invariably when it is transfusion transmitted, it's from a person who came from one of those countries, uh, not a casual traveler. So for all we worry about people's travel, what we should really be doing is saying, have you uh, ever had malaria? And if you grew up in Liberia or something, it's not that it was a donor at all, although we need to talk about that a little bit more. Um, Non-infectious risks, uh, we'll talk about things like volume overload, and uh, probably those are in fact much more common than, than some of the infectious risks, as well as other things that I've described. This looks like a football field, but it is really a hauling risk scale, where 10 to the 3 is a 1 in a 1,000 chance, 10 to the 6 is therefore 1 in a million chance. And you can see the things we screen for, HIV, hepatitis B and C, are on the order of one in two million. Uh, who here plans to do two million transfusions during their medical career? Right? You know, this just doesn't happen. On the other hand, volume overload, uh, somewhere between one in a hundred and one in a thousand, depending upon the patient population uh, you're working with. Metabolic complications, anyone who's doing a lot of pediatric stuff, um, kids are really easy to tip over. So um, there's uh, many different metabolic stuff that can happen in kids. Um, getting to transfusion reactions, again, us blood bankers get so excited about Gerbiches and Duffies and Big C's and Kells and JKAs. Um, it is important to do all that screening, uh, but in fact from a fatality standpoint, uh, hemolytic is a really big deal to worry about. There are still, sadly, two to three hemolytic deaths per year. People that are group O that got group A or group B blood because somebody didn't check an armband. So who here has sent a sample to the lab and had it rejected because you forgot the middle initial of the patient, right? Really annoying. Don't you, doesn't it just annoy us? God bless the lab for doing that. Because that's exact, by having a zero tolerance policy, that is how we have gotten to, when I trained, it was 10 or 20 fatalities a year out of 10 million transfusions. And yes, I know you weren't born then. Um, I, you were thinking it. Um, but no, I mean, when Ellen and I trained, just kidding, um, it was it was two dozen or more fatalities a year. And by having a very strict zero tolerance policy for mislabeled specimens, and the blood bank was really the leader of the lab in doing that, uh, we have virtually eliminated those, those errors. Um, delayed hemolytic transfusion reactions, again, forming antibodies. We all form antibodies against the stuff we don't have, 
Um, and so typically, ABO, you can have antibodies right away, but all the rest, you need to be exposed to that. And it's often two to three weeks later. So it is important, if you're having something that's uh, uh, gotten a lot of transfusions, that somebody is following up with them uh, in the weeks after, that you're not just sending them off to, to, to nowhere. It's uh, warning them, you know, if you're not feeling well or uh, having any other symptoms, and in the next month, give us a call, because people can make antibodies two, three weeks later, and if their uh, significant portion of their blood turns out to have been incompatible, they can hemolyze after one moment. Um, the only kind of transfusion reaction you should feel comfortable restarting the unit is a, a mild allergic reaction where, yeah, stopping the plasma and giving uh, uh, an antihistamine and restarting is, is probably okay. Um, so, <clears throat> by far, the most common fatality from transfusion was and remains transfusion-associated lung injury or trolley. Does anybody know what happened right here that dropped the trolley numbers in half? Who's more dangerous here in the room, the men or the women? Well, it depends upon to whom. So 80% of our massive transfusions at Hennepin County are men having done something really stupid to themselves, right? Um, however, from a transfusion standpoint, what happened is the American Association of Blood Banks created a rule in 2007 that over the next year or two, you needed to have a plan for trolley reduction, which basically meant eliminating females from the pla uh, uh, plasma transfusion pool and doing something about platelets. Um, so, uh, for example, in, in Minnesota, we actually screen our female platelet donors with an anti-HLA antibody since we can eliminate half the platelet donors overnight. But in fact, this drop has been literally overnight and a half. And in fact, many of these residuals were from AB plasma, still from, from female donors, and we're now under a mandate to eliminate um, female uh, AB donors, which uh, innovative blood resources have been able to do it for more than a, a year. You can see TACO is transfusion associated cardiac overload. Good name, right? Uh, that's probably grossly underreported, uh, so it probably is actually many more cases than that, but that's what's reported to the FDA. So getting to TACO, typically a large volume of product transfusing a short time to somebody with a limited cardiac reserve, cardiac and renal reserve, tolerated. Um, a way of identifying TACO is the laboratory level of BNP, a brain natriuretic protein, tends to go up very high when you have right heart failure, which you certainly is, a, is part and parcel of, of TACO. If it's, a, if it's grossly elevated, it's probably TACO. If it's a little bit elevated, it actually doesn't distinguish between college and, and uh, TACO. Transfusion-associated lung injury is probably the final common pathway of many different etiologies, but certainly common to many of them is antibody in the transfused plasma. So not all, but many of those fatalities are related to either plasma or platelet transfusions. There still are some with red cells, and there still is some plasma left in a red cell, but only around 20 to 50 mils. Most of that has been removed in an additive solution replaced. Most typically, uh, when identified, the donor has been a female who's had one or more uh, children. Interestingly, prior transfusion did not turn out to be um, uh, uh, terribly well associated, so we actually are not asking males, donors, if they've been previously transfused. Um, so as I mentioned, this guidance correlates with that dramatic drop, 50% drop in the rate of fatalities uh, in the nation. It's a wonderful evidence-based usage uh, um, uh, intervention. But basically, the trolley uh, guidance requested three things. One, that blood centers do something, and so we went to the all male plasma donor uh, and, and are screening the, the apheresis platelets. Um, that we enforce evidence-based medicine, meaning the safest transfusion 
one that's least likely to have a reaction is the one never given. So if your only transfusion where the patient absolutely clearly has an indication for transfusion, then you can reduce reactions from unnecessary transfusions. And then finally, we will never know whether we're doing better unless we have some sort of feedback mechanism to collect data. And so most other developed countries, Canada, Europe, has what's called hemovigilance systems or biovigilance systems where they nationally track these adverse reaction rates. And so the American Association of Blood Banks is working with the uh, uh, HHS and the CDC that create both donor uh, uh, reaction, central, uh, reaction uh, registries as well as patient reaction registries with a focus on severe uh, reactions. Um, so as I mentioned, the probably mitigation steps include going to all male plasma and screening the uh, females with anti-HLA uh, antibody. Um, <clears throat> talking just as an example of um, uh, evidence-based usage, uh, I also cover a, a large trauma hospital in Tennant County. And you can see the number of Titan screens, this white bar, when people lost their jobs and lost their insurance, they didn't stop getting health care. They just came to Hennepin because they don't often pay us. <laughs> oh, well, we're this eight unit hospital, what can I say? So at a time when the Titan screens were going from 3,000 to almost double that number, the amount of red cell use went down. And in fact, between uh, um, 2009 and 2013, it actually went down 24%. So I like to kid my CEO that the blood center makes its money selling blood to hospitals, and I tell them how to use less. What a great job. But viewed as blood is a precious community resource to be husbanded and used wisely, this I think makes uh, tremendous sense. And you can see the amount of plasma has decreased at the same time that we actually had a more aggressive use of plasma and massive transfusion. Uh, we also actually are fortunate to be the hospital targeted by the Jehovah's Witness community as having uh, tolerant docs. And so we work with the Jehovah's Witness community to try to avoid transfusions were not necessary. We actually have a uh, um, published in Minnesota Medicine a whole wonderful little checklist that's very useful to use and we've got a bleeding patient that Jehovah's Witness and just it lists all the different kinds of alternatives that, that some Jehovah's Witnesses will take and others won't. But at least that way you'll have a checklist that know that you ask them all the all the possible options. But we have learned a tremendous amount from the Jehovah's Witness community. Uh, including just how robust the human body can be. So my cardiac output at rest is probably about five liters a minute. Um, when I am foolish and um, acting uh, juvenile and trying to row with the young guys, um, my cardiac output probably goes up to 25 liters a minute, meaning I can increase cardiac output fivefold by rate and stroke volume, right? And so if your only job is to lay there on the operating room table, you can compensate for anemia probably about fivefold by pumping up you know, the blood through faster. So if your normal hemoglobin hematocrit is 45, you can drop down to 9. Or if your normal hemoglobin is 15, you can drop down to about 3. But that is the absolute limit of compensation. And obviously, people with compromised cardiac function may be more limited, they may not be able to do a full five-fold. So no surprise, ain't nobody dies with a hemoglobin above five, which is a crit of about 15. Um, a lot of people die when your hemoglobin gets below two. And you know, it's a these are not super large numbers, but you can see clearly below three people have a high risk of, of, of mortality. This is done by my paper with uh, by my friend Jeff Carson who has the dubious distinction of presiding over a hospital in Englewood, New Jersey, where if you think we collect the Jehovah's Witnesses, they have them from the entire <coughs> New England area. So, uh, so it shouldn't surprise us that in a randomized prospective trial that could only be done in Canada, where you could actually get two doctors and two ICUs to actually follow the same protocol, um, they did a randomized prospective trial. You're probably familiar with the Hubert trial, <coughs> or the, the, uh, the TRIC trial, 
which is transfusion in the ICU, randomized prospective trial, seven versus nine bins. You, you don't get into an ICU in Canada because you're healthy either. I mean, their patients are just as sick in the ICU as ours. Um, and they did just as well or better at the lower transfusion trigger of, of seven. And that, this is one of the most cited trials. Um, but Jeff followed up on this and did this with little old ladies getting hip surgery <coughs> who had a known cardiac history. Because we often say, well, yeah, yeah, I know that's true for the general patient, but what about the person that had a heart attack five years ago? Well, in little old ladies getting hip surgeries who had a known cardiac history, did a um, prospective randomized trial. In this case, it was eight versus 10, because Jeff didn't think he could get any orthopedic surgeons to sign anyone up for, at seven. Uh, that's, I, I'm not making that up. That is the reason why it was eight versus 10 as opposed to seven versus nine. And it had two different outcomes. One was death, and the other was inability to walk uh, across a room on a 60-day follow-up. Why? Because the typical orthopedic surgeon said, oh, yeah, yeah, I know they do, they live, but they don't feel very comfortable. I want to mobilize them. I want to get them out of bed faster so they recover faster. So this was a direct measure of do they recover faster? And since this is hip surgery, walking is a wonderful way of measuring that. Anyway, bottom line is absolutely no difference, no benefit, and higher complication rate from transfusion of those people that got transfused, which is obviously higher, higher level. Randomized prospective trial, GI, well, GI bleed, you better give a good buffer to them because you never know when they're going to let loose, which is true. And it's, when they do let loose, it's really messy. So you really don't want to make them let loose more, right? So who lets loose more? A randomized prospective trial, seven versus nine again, there was a higher rebleed rate when you transfuse them more, right? If you have higher pressure in your hose, you're going to leak more, right? And they actually measured the, um, the, the portal pressure in the, in the uh, blood vessels going to the intestines, and it was higher in the people when you transfuse more. No surprise, they put the tank higher and there's higher pressure. Um, so ABB has come to a consensus guideline. The slide's purpose is just to tell you that there is a consensus guideline out there. And I can tell you, having been at the Joint Transfusion Committee this morning, this is exactly what it says, because they cut and pasted the table from the ABB consensus guideline. And it basically says uh, 7 to 8, and uh, you know, if you're, you're having massive transfusion, there, may, you know, there are certainly major exceptions. Uh, but there really is no uh, group that um, pediatric that neonates obviously accepted, uh, no adult group that, that uh, uh, there's a lot of evidence to transfuse at a higher um, higher threshold. The one the one exception, major exception, is three people presenting with a, a cardiac myocardial infarction in process actually do do better with hemoglobins above 10. Uh, and there is an ongoing prospective study, but until that's out, um, that might be a, a reasonable exception. That's not past history, that is acute now uh, uh, MI. So age of the red cells. So there was this wonderful study out of the Cleveland Clinic where they looked retrospectively at 12,000 patients, about 3,000 of which, about a quarter of which, mostly got old blood about a quarter of which mostly got fresher blood, and the middle half they didn't even look at. Um, and they found that there were a number of differences between those that mostly got blood that was less than 14 days versus mostly blood that got older than 14 days. And you know, twice the mortality, longer intubation, more renal dysfunction, first hypertrophy. God, I want that first stuff too, right? The problem is, is when you have a retrospective large group, you may well have selection biases that just make those two groups a little hard to compare, um, including uh, we use O blood for emergencies more, so that's fresher, always lower uh, clotting factors. I mean, there's a lot of diff reasons that they might well be different. What you see is, in fact, most of the, the curve where they're spreading apart happens long after the transfused blood is gone. So this is the kind of thing you would expect to see when the two groups are different as opposed to the 
uh, actual transfused blood, which is only around for a few weeks. Um, apples, oranges, <laughs> uh, So in a study, again, that can only be done in, in Denmark, where they have a wonderful nationalized uh, system that tracks everybody. And if, if you think this smacks of Obamacare, I'd like to point out that um, Denmark, uh, Denmark is one of the happiest countries on the planet. Okay, so they're happy with their nationalized medicine. <clears throat> 405,000 people followed for transfusion. Looked at seven day risk of death. Anyway, the bottom line is you do no difference or there's teeny tiny difference, which um, has clear confounding because people that get transfused often also are the sicker group and so there's clear evidence of confounding. So the bottom line is a little hard to, to uh, say that that is supported. So there's while, so there's been a whole series of retrospective analyses. The bottom line is it's really hard to establish causation from a retrospective analysis. It basically can't be done. Um, so there are a series of prospective studies that are ongoing, only one of which has been reported so far. And um, little people being little, it's easier to um, collect data and follow up on little people. And so the one study that's out so far is a neonatal age of blood transfusion study, where it was super fresh average five days old versus standard of care, which is about two weeks old. And again, if you give really old blood to a neonate, you cause um, hyperkalemia. Um, so there's reasons they couldn't get real old stuff. Um, anyway, absolute no difference between the two groups. So in the one randomized prospective trial to date, again, Nick, you can't generalize that to your patient population, uh, no, no evidence of benefit. Uh, the one thing I do want to rant and rave about is autologous donations. I'm incredibly proud of the Lincoln, Nebraska community that outdated exactly zero autologous units uh, this year because none were drawn. Um, I attended a transfusion committee at noon yesterday um, in a, uh, well, Duluth, Minnesota, um, where um, Guess what their outdate rate was on their autologous units? 100%. Um, they've got this oral surgeon. Anyway, I won't go there. Um, if you're having 100% outdate, do you think that maybe is not a useful product? You're making the patient anemic and cranky. They get charged for it, and then they don't use it. Anyway, 50 to 70% of units used nationwide. Uh, autologous units are never transfused, so it, it results in increased uh, economic cost um, and little documentation of patient benefit. So uh, even if you do have a patient that's absolutely pleading for it, it's worth having a dispassionate discussion of uh, risks, benefits, and, and why it probably does not make much sense. So, which gets us to blood management. So most hospitals are introducing some sort of blood management program, which is really just a systematic look at who is using what. Um, are, there, uh, are there cardiac surgeons that are using twice as much blood as others? But you know, if, if they have a better patient outcome, well, maybe that's good. But if they don't, maybe those all that extra transfusion isn't warranted. And just starting with some very simple things like are you transfusing according to the guidelines? Um, and having those kind of tools uh, and then moving into computer tracking tools which just make that process easier um, has resulted in a significant decrease in usage. The United States, sadly, was using over 55 units per thousand population. We are now down to about 45 units. Canada is probably closer to 30 units, and guess what? They live just as long or longer up there. Uh, so clearly, some there's still some transfusions that are happening uh, here that probably aren't benefiting the, uh, the patient. The one thing that I would caution against is some people have become so um, evangelical about their uh, preaching against blood 
that it then encourages irrational use of more expensive alternatives such as recombinant 7A or erythropoietin. Uh, and in fact, there are complications of both of those uh, alternatives, uh, uh, actually clotting in both, um, which, which makes uh, one uh, should have caution before recommending either of those alternatives. Which gets us to transfusion guidelines. So there are multiple benefits to transfusion guidelines. Um, the main uh, which is every donation is a precious gift to be used wisely. And it is a community resource to be, to be husbanded and to make sure that, that it is available for those that truly need it, not wasting it on people that don't need it is probably the most important. Um, it is not lost upon you that we are in a time of uh, there are now limits to how much the medical care budget can grow each year. And as people like me get older and grayer, our need for blood is going to go up just from aging demographics. And so if we're going to take care of more people, you know, 30 plus percent more people now have access to health care. Um, so we're going to need to have uh, some approach to um, health care costs. And if we can eliminate a cost that isn't benefiting patients, well, boy, that's the, that's the, the, the best option. So as I mentioned, the ABB guidelines, and there are similar guidelines out there from other groups, basically saying, uh, hemoglobin of seven, uh, you know, obviously going into pre-op, you may want a little higher if you know you're going to have some, some blood loss. And I meant, already mentioned the, the higher trigger and setting of acute MI. Uh, prophylactic platelets, there are now some wonderful studies showing that there actually is no additional benefit to transfusing platelets just for the number when it's above 10,000. Below 10,000 people certainly, and certainly below 5,000 people certainly have spontaneous bleeding. But the rate of bleeding, uh, there was a wonderful study called the Plato study, basically watching rate of bleeding in bone marrow transplant patients. And they had a rather significant rate of bleeding, uh, uh, bruising, nosebleeds. I mean, it's not that was clinically significant. It was like 20% a day. And it was hard to say today whether the platelet count was 20,000 or 50,000. So having the platelet count higher didn't actually change when you blast people with the awful drugs that we use for, for a myeloablative of bone marrow transplants, you know, they leak from every pore because they just had holes blasted in their pores. Um, but only when they get below five to 10,000 do you have a um, significantly uh, a rate of bleeding that is addressed by fatal transfusions. Um, so again, obviously in surgery, you're going to need a higher count. So something uh, getting to at least 50,000 for surgery is fine. And typically, one platelet pool, again, uh, uh, is enough. Plasma guidelines, there is no evidence that giving plasma when the INR is below 1.5 uh, does anything to decrease uh, bleeding. Um, and remember, we put people on warfarin to intentionally get them to 2.5 to 3.5. And, and if you're not getting them above 2, you're not achieving uh, therapeutic anticoagulation. Um, so this is one of my favorite slides. This happens to be the Finnish National Transfusion Service, but I guarantee you it is equally true here. So this is the number of units of plasma transfused at a single setting. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. What you notice is physicians can only order in even numbers. Huh. Now, Blood volume, about 70 mL per kilo, but it's not all yellow, right? I mean, some of it is red and some of it's yellow. About 3 sevenths, a crit of 42, is the red cells. 4 sevenths is plasma volume. We won't worry about the white cells, they're just annoying. Uh, 4 sevenths times 70 is 40 mL per kilo is your plasma volume, just as a, a rough figure. I'm a big boy. I'm 100 kilos. Or a little more, I'm sorry. <coughs> That's a liter of plasma. That's four units of plasma. So the typical patient get to get 10 to, to 15 mils per kilo, which is, and you need about a quarter of your coagulation factor to have adequate in most cases. So that's where the 10 comes from, and 15 is giving you a little buffer. So 10 to 15 mils per kilo times the typical patient weight is at least three units. 
for most patients. So two is homeopathy in, in, in many patients. So the, the old standard of treating with FFP transfusion makes no sense. It should be a, a, a curve that resembles the weight population, which uh, is increasingly red-shifted, but we won't go there. Um, so just to give you evidence of this, in most developed countries, as I mentioned, it's about 30 to 40, now 45 units of red cells per thousand population. But in countries where us physicians can do anything we want, Germany, US, Sweden, the ratio of red cells to FFP is about uh, 3 to 1. The ratio of red cells to FFP in countries that are nationalized medical care where they actually have to have to abide by evidence-based guidelines is closer to 6 or 7 to 1. And guess what? Their outcomes are just as good or better than ours. Um, so clearly we are transfusing a lot of FFP where it's, it's doing the patient no good. And this would be an epidemiologic evidence thereof. More direct measure though is this is from the, the Zeke paper that I mentioned before. If you look at INR versus estimated blood loss, does this not look like the dartboard at your favorite pub? Right? I mean, there is no correlation coefficient there whatsoever. So it's not to say that if you have an INR of 10, you're not at risk of bleeding. You absolutely are. Um, but once you get below, and here's the INR, once, and, and they were arguing below 1.85, but at the very least, below 1.5, there certainly is no correlation of bleeding with uh, low INR. So again, another reason is if you do transfuse, so the, the Mass General, Sunny Z, cast the gauntlet and said, okay, surgeon, if I'm going to give you the FFP, at least do me the favor of getting an INR after the transfusion as well as before. And the net change, in most cases, was zero. So if you have an INR of 10 and you give FFP, yes, it will absolutely drop. If you have an INR of 1.5 um, and you give FFP, it often doesn't drop, and there's a couple reasons. One, when people have um, liver failure, they're not clearing fibrin split products, and fibrin split products act as inhibitors, at least inhibitors to the assay, uh, the INR assay. Two, the um, INR of FFP is not one. It's higher than one because the reason it doesn't clot in the bag is we've thinned it out with anticoagulants, so it's diluted. Um, again, here's the, the reason we anticoagulate people to INRs of two and a half to three and a half for a, you know, a, a artificial valve or something is only when you get to 10 to 20 percent of normal vitamin K dependent coag factors do you have adequate hemostasis. Now, part of the challenge is that's a very narrow zone. And even in the best uh, uh, Coumadin clinics, people are only in that range about 50 to 60 percent of the time. Um, and, and generally, those are in you know, observed clinical trials. And in real life, I can guarantee our Hennepin patients uh, would be lucky to be close to that. Um, so it's not that hard giving FFP to get somebody from 5 down to 3. But it's terribly hard to go from 1.3 down to 1.1. That might be more volume than you can give them. And there are plenty of cases that, that Sonny has reported at Mass General where people have actually put people into cardiac failure trying to get enough FFP to get, but my, pretending to get them below a 1.2. Well, if you keep you know, pumping in, that's what happens. Which gets us to massive transfusion in the icky pictures. So we have learned a lot from our surgical and medical colleagues that have come back from the Gulf Wars uh, <coughs> and Afghanistan uh, uh, conflicts. And some of the things they've learned is soldiers are, are surviving much better with access, ready access to blood products. And so what they were doing was screening uh, group O soldiers every month for infectious disease stuff. And then an IED goes off, you stick a needle into the soldier's arm, get some blood, and blood is hanging while you go back. So that came back, so a lot of uh, docs came back with, oh, I need to have fresh whole blood, right? They then did the study once platelets could actually be gotten into the field in, in Afghanistan and in Iraq, and did a comparative study. If you have component therapy, which is um, 
I think the, the white, uh, the red bars versus the white bars, uh, as opposed to fresh whole blood, the results were just as good. People that didn't get any platelets or plasma, however, did worse, and which is which is what the ratio of, of the red cells to plasma. So they came back with the idea that having some fixed ratio is good. And so sadly, into the liter into the military literature came this magic well. We're giving whole blood and uh, uh, red cells and plasma are a one-to-one, -one, right? If you take a bag of whole blood and divide it into red cells and plasma, that's one unit of plasma, one unit of red cells. So therefore, that must be the best ratio, right? Because that's physiologic. In fact, um, it takes a while to thaw a unit of FMP. Mm -hmm. So asking for a one-to-one -one ratio is not necessarily in the patient's benefit when they need a lot of stuff right away. So for example, at our trauma hospital, we're using a two-to-one ratio, and that way we can get coolers out faster because it doesn't take us long, as long to thaw that, that plasma. And in fact, there's a Canadian consensus trial that reviewed all the literature, and there is no evidence to favor one ratio or another. It doesn't mean two to one is better than one to one. It means that beware of dogma that there is a magic ratio that, that absolutely, absolutely does. And in fact, if you're giving an entire blood volume of red cells and then later plasma, not giving any platelets, you will get a dilutional coagulopathy of the platelets. So what you don't want to do is give a ton of red cells or a ton of saline, dilute the person out, and then try to get a lot of plasma or platelets into them. Now you get into volume overload. You can't. So once you've developed a dilutional coagulopathy, it's very hard to get out of it. So far better to prevent it. And that is essentially the magic of the, of the um, massive transfusion protocols. So this is an interesting study, actually out of Emory, suggesting that there was actually higher mortality at a one-to-one -one ratio than a one-to-two. Now again, this is retrospective. These are not heroic numbers. So it's a little hard to interpret. But this was actually the study that I used to justify not doing a one-to-one -one ratio at our trauma hospital. And here's the Canadian consensus conference that I discussed. Oh, one uh, other thing, though, is the CRASH-2 trial did show that early use of tranexamic acid, an anti-fibrinolytic agent, actually helps in decreasing the uh, amount of blood loss and hence survival. Um, so I actually will skip over that. Um, recombinant 7A, uh, <clears throat> wonderful, wonderful scathing article and editorial in Annals of Internal Medicine about two years ago now. 95% um, of the use of recombinant 7A was off-label with no evidence that it was doing any good and now evolving evidence that it was causing harm. Clots, uh, MIs, strokes, uh, PEs. Um, <clears throat> and so, um, for example, a, uh, a, a, a trial called control trial, uh, randomized phase three trial, very large number of patients uh, looking at um, standard practice versus a reasonably high dose of, uh, of 7A, um, this amount would be about $20,000, by the way. Um, and um, no benefit whatsoever in that case. Um, so, so here we have a rapidly increasing use of a treatment that does not benefit patients and increases the risk of dangerous thrombotic events at which investigators estimate cost $10,000 per dose, and it's actually gone up since then. Allowing physician autonomy to choose medications is appealing, but not when it results in unhelpful, dangerous, or costly decisions. And so we've had a 95% reduction of our recombinant 7A use in, um, in Hennepin. Actually, in 2012, I, I've carefully left off the slide because it was about the same as 2010. But that was one patient with acquired von Willebrand's which is actually an appropriate package insert indication. We sent them to the university. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, recommendations. Uh, assess current usage to avoid adverse effects of transfusion. Um, having a uh, transfusion and tissue committee, which I mentioned I had the honor to attend. Single versus multiple unit transfusion. One of the low hanging fruit is to suggest transfuse one unit. Check the hemoglobin. Maybe that's enough for your 
little old lady who you're only transfusing because her hemoglobin happened to be seven, and if it's up to nine and she's feeling okay, well, stop after one unit. That's probably enough. And again, at Hennepin, by hardwiring that into computer physician order entry, we immediately went from 60% per unit, 40% one unit, to an inverse ratio. Now it's 60% one unit. Uh, we're still having plenty of two-unit transfusions, but again, with the common center, there's plenty of people that are bleeding to that. Um, and, um, yeah, and that has resulted in a uh, health result in that sustained decrease in uh, product usage. Uh, so here, that slide term is reversal in the ratios. And that is where I am on time. Any questions? Earlier you said there was a, kind of some kind of reporting system for transfusion-related events, or this trolley. Um, is that just going for kind of research in the future, or if we are uh, if you're, uh, transfusing someone where the provider in the front lines by chance know if they've had any reactions in the past, um, if we have a poor historian, um, is, is there anything like that in place? Or so right now, the reporting is unidirectional, not bidirectional. Um, so it's not down to, in fact, we're not actually reporting who the patient is. So there is actually sort of HIPAA confidentiality built into the system. Um, so is a voluntary, hospital voluntary reporting system? So actually, I haven't asked whether St. Hughes or, or, or Brian is participating in that. Um, uh, it annoys my, my transfusion surf, service staff greatly because it's probably half an hour of somebody's time each week to enter all the transfusion, when well, we do a week, but enter all the, the major transfusion reactions. So the person that gets a you know, little bit of itchy eye that does not get represented, I'm just not going to 